<coughs> Did she say yes? Yeah, yes. Cool. So good evening. Welcome to Freedom Night. Wednesday night, one of our uh, favorite nights of the week. Yep. Um, for, for many reasons, we get to join with people and uh, worship our Lord. We also get to help people find freedom, and we help find ourselves some freedom as well. So uh, very cool to have everyone here. Welcome online audience. We uh, appreciate people watching. My name is Dave Cook. I am one of the teachers of uh, Freedom Night. And tonight I get the pleasure of teaching Kinsman Redeemer for the first time. So uh, anytime you teach the subject for the first time, it uh, challenges you and gets you an opportunity to really study the word and um, really pray about it and see what God has to say for you. Um, so uh, if you, everyone in here has been here before, but for any of our online audience that are new, we're teaching from Biblical Foundations of Freedom, a uh, book by Art Matthias. Um, you'll notice in gold, I found freedom, which is what this is all about, finding freedom from the uh, spirits of the fact that try and ruin our lives, try and do all kinds of things. That's the book that we um, use, but that book is based upon the Bible and um, a real study of the Bible that Art did and the application of God's Word, um, which is the important thing. We don't want to do anything that some guy tells us to do. Um, we want it based on the Bible, and this book is based on the Bible. Um, and some real thoughtful interpretations. So uh, tonight we're going we're to talk a lot about the Bible because Kinsman Redeemer is all over the Bible, like way more than I had a clue it is. Um, <laughs> Am I not speaking into the microphone? I'm just checking for sound. Okay. Carry right on. <laughs> so. Uh, other resources that are available, the free Icon Freedom book is available in the back. <clears throat> there is a study guide available in the back as well that uh, is not uh, just a typical repeat of the book. It actually sends you a search of questions and answers and uh, is very valuable, I think, for the study. Um, Icon Freedom Seminar, um, the entire course is in the seminar book and we offer seminars on um, Biblical Foundations of Freedom and on helping other people find freedom. Um, next one's coming up in May, Janice? Yes. yes. Uh, May, first two weeks of May. First two weeks of May. Um, incredibly life-changing experience if you haven't been to it, something to really consider. Um, and finally, or I guess not quite finally, but almost, um, Janice's book, Which Do You Choose? Um, which is basically the Biblical Foundations of Freedom shrunk down into a kid version um, and the title kind of says it all. What do you choose? Literally everything about um, the biblical foundations, about living a godly life, about um, finding peace and joy is all about choices. It really is. And uh, which you choose, which kingdom do you choose to serve? And that's what the book is about. And now finally, um, the um, church offers the Wellsprings Ministries offers one-on-one -on -one counseling that's available. Um, there's a form. I thank you for what you've revealed to me as I have studied this much. I pray that you speak to each person here and each person online, that you individually give them the message that you want them to hear, that you are an individual God, you are an awesome God, that for each and every one of us, you have an individual message and a universal message that you love us and that you are redeeming us, that you will be our redeemer. 
Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit that would block that or kept the block the message tonight to block our hearing the hair out of it or in there about what we think. The Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. We ask you to join us and speak to us that you give revelation to us. Pray that you bless everyone here and all those online watching in Jesus Amen. So, um, last week, my beautiful bride taught on the um, power and authority. Hey, on power and authority um, that we get from God. And one of the, um, the important things Revelation tells us is that you overcome the enemy by the power of their testimony, by repeating what God's done for us. So, before we delve into the class, anyone have a testimony they'd like to share how God worked in their life this week? I know God works in all of our lives, but did you have something, Robert? Well, yeah, the thought occurs to me. I'm just inclined to say something. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the phrase, as I lean into him, he'll lean into me, uh, occurs to me. And I've been trying to do that more often and more. And uh, life is good. It's, there's a spiritual life that, that uh, just tell exists if you play by the spiritual rules. If you think about it more often, uh, call his name more often, things work out. They do. They do. They do indeed. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Did you have some questions? Yes, uh, yeah. To be honest, we uh, the summer we started coming uh, to the class and we started on the right away. Every way of expectation this is going to be developed. And as a broad perspective, this is pride because I got reinforced and showed up in the way I didn't expect. This week was really something because I started realizing, especially since we've been studying this one week, I started realizing the idols that were on my character. Things that I thought, well, that's, that's not vital. That's not a big deal. That's nothing, nothing wrong with that. Right. But to point out, and I realized I had to name that. I had to say that that is an idol. I had to tell the enemy, I didn't want that idol in my life. I had to tell God, I wanted to do it with that. Uh, we can study the book and start to realize. I mean, it's not like I wasn't to realize this already. And the realization of this week has been a blessing for me to understand. God will not dwell in an unholy place. He will not dwell in something that's unholy. Therefore, if I am allowing anything unholy to myself, no matter what I think about it, He will not dwell there. I must have to dwell there, otherwise, the enemy will have to dwell there. So I was really blessed to find that to discover that this week has brought me a lot more peace. Yeah. That's very powerful, very powerful message. I hope that the microphone picked it up and you shared a very powerful testimony um, about the peace that we found during this week. And also about the uh, expectations of this class not being what you expect. And if people want to hear, if you haven't been to a biblical foundation class, and if, particularly if you haven't delved into it and haven't done an honest introspection like you're doing, and let God speak to you. People, people have a complete different misunderstanding. Truly, that's what this class is about. Let you hear God's voice and go, that's an idol. Get rid of it. You know? And that's a beautiful testimony. Thank you for sharing. That's very beautiful. Thank you. Anybody else have anything they'd like to share? Oh, God. Uh, I remember when I first started going to this class in 2004, I went through this crazy process of being in Gradually, we got through One of the things I remember then, that we started this time when I started teaching final, is you know, when you're out hunting and stuff, you don't realize until you sit down and eat something just how empty you were, how hungry your, your body is. Once you start eating, you go, God, I'm really hungry, you want more. And that 
that's when I started to realize uh, in the period of the I was so empty. And, uh, I, I didn't realize how empty or how hungry I really was. So I started getting the word again and fed again. And uh, it's just refreshing to start having that all happen to me. It's in tune with the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and refreshing words of love, especially in this environment here. Uh, you, and Janice, and Robert, people that teach and send me, it just, uh, there's so much love. It's not like a, people say, I say it's a class. It's a, uh, a class. You know? Right. It's not a class. It's, I don't even know. it's something different than a class. It's different than a class. It is. It is. It's something different than a class. And I mean, Cindy and I have been coming here for like nine years every Wednesday and to, to repeat 12, 15 lessons, you know, but it's so much more than class. One of the best analogies I can use, I remember I had an aunt that uh, was extremely loving and extremely spiritual. Every once in a while she was sitting down and explaining things to me and saying, this is what I see you doing, this is what I think, and what's going on with you. I just want to encourage you to do that and you pray with me. That's what it's like. You know, it's like So uh, two absolutely beautiful testimonies. Uh, really, if you sit back and you look at, at what God um, does in your life, just one quick testimony for me. Uh, as I studied and prepared for this class, I was raised by a very godly man by uh, a wonderful father raised in the church. I've walked with the Lord a long time, but I'm studying this course, and I come to the realization that I've seen Jesus, Yeshua, the Redeemer, as an Easter morning kind of guy. Right? On Easter morning, you get up and you put up the cross and you celebrate that my Redeemer lives, and you sing, I know that my Redeemer lives. And the day after Easter, you kind of put it back on the shelf and Man, that ain't what the Bible says about the Redeemer. <laughs> that ain't what the Bible says about the Redeemer at all. And when you start studying the Bible about the Redeemer, you get blown away. Blown away. I was blown away this week. That's my testimony, what God did for me this week. He blew me away and told me, dude, you have no clue. Um, I hope I have enough of a clue that I can <clears throat> relay to you the importance of the Redeemer. Um, but I know I've got a lot more studying to do, too. Um, and, and I studied all week. My thought, I watched several people present this class because, like I said, it's the first time I've tried it. And my thought was, I was going to read the book of Ruth to you because um, the instructors always stand up here and say, read Ruth. You should read Ruth. If you haven't read Ruth, read Ruth. And then they move on. And so I read Ruth to myself out loud, like, 13 times and 14 minutes was the shortest I can get. And 14 minutes in this class is the eternity. So I'm not going to read the book of Ruth. But guys, I'm telling you, the entire gospel message is wrapped up in the book of Ruth. If you read it and you ask Holy Spirit to talk to you, the gospel message is in Ruth and it blows you off the way. Four pages, 14 minutes read is really, really, really worth reading. I summarized it as best I can. So I'm going to give you the summary of Ruth, and then we're going to talk about Ruth, and then we're going to talk about the Kinsman Redeemer. The book of Ruth starts off with, during the time of the judges, and then proceeds. You have to understand, the time of the judges refers to a time when man did what he thought was right in his own mind. That's what the time of the judges means. It doesn't mean they're walking with God. It means they're doing what they felt was right. I don't know about y'all, but most of the time when I do what I think is right, I miss the mark. Right? <laughs> because God's got a perfect mark. And so the book of Ruth starts off telling us that people probably weren't walking with God very well. Out of Bethlehem, a guy named Elimelech, which means God is my king. That's what Elimelech means. Names are important. And you need to understand names and the importance of them to also pick up on the story and what's going on. Elimelech, which means God is my king, takes his wife, Naomi, 
which means pleasantness, sweetness. It's a very sweet word. And they leave Judah, where they live, because of a famine, and they go to Moab. They sojourn to Moab. And sojourn implies that it's a short journey, right? A walkabout. They go to Moab with their two sons, who are Mullen, M-A-H-L-O-N, which means sickness. There's an implication that probably there's some problems going on. And their son, Chilean, which means destruction. They take Mullen and Chilean, and they sojourn to the land of Moab. It should be a short stay. While they're there, a little bit dies. And his sons take Moabite women as wives, which is prohibited for a Hebrew man to take a Moabite woman as his wife because Moabites worship other gods, a multitude of gods. And Yahweh says, nope, not so much, right? Not so much. But each of the boys take a Moabite woman, woman as their wife. Then both of the boys die. Both the boys die. Naomi realizes the enemy, you hear in this class, the enemy will take you further than you want to go which he did, took her into Moab and kept her there. He'll keep you there longer than you want to stay. That's what Naomi realized. So she sets out to return to the promised land, which if you read Ruth and you pray about it, the promised land is more than a piece of real estate. Ruth is returning to God. That's what Ruth's saying. When she sets out to go back to Judah, I am going back to my God. This hasn't worked out so well for me. I'm going back to my God. And that's what Ruth is saying. So with her, her two daughter-in-laws, Orpah and Ruth, start on the journey. As they're journeying, Naomi says, girls, go back to your family. Go to your mother's, live in your mother's house, find husbands. I can't give more sons. You can't wait for sons. Don't come with me. Orpah says, I'm going back to my family and my gods. And Ruth makes the most important decision of her life, probably of our lives. Ruth says, don't send me back. Where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Your God will be my God. At that second, uh, Ruth becomes a Hebrew. She has crossed over. She has crossed over which, again, the gospel message wrapped up in Ruth. Ruth professes, your God will be my God, and she has crossed over. Naomi and Ruth arrive in Bethlehem, feeling dejected. Um, Ruth, or excuse me, Naomi particularly is feeling rejected and neglected, and says, when all the people walk her and they go, Naomi, oh, Naomi, welcome back. And she says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, which is bitterness. Bitterness. Call me Mara, because God has turned his hand against me. She's lost her husband, she's lost her son, she's... When, when we talk about broke, busted, and disgusted, look at Ruth. Ruth comes back to Bethlehem, and she is broke, busted, and disgusted. That is, that's all there is. Or Naomi, excuse me, yeah. Naomi. So they're living in Bethlehem for a while, and Ruth says to Naomi, her mother-in-law, let me go glean the fields, because God made a provision for this traveler and for the foreigner that a farmer was not to harvest his entire crop, that he was to leave crops for the traveler, the foreigner, for the poor people to go out and work, not to get welfare, but to work and go in the field and obtain some sheaves of the harvest. So Ruth asked to do that. Um, Ruth happens, you know how things happen to occur in, in God's world? Ruth happens to end up in the field of a guy named Boaz, who is a close kinsman relative of Naomi. He is a Limelech's brother. Younger brother, so there's an older brother that has first rights. But she happens to wind up in Boaz's field. As you read Ruth, you figure out very quickly that Boaz is a man of God. Boaz appears 
to his field, and as he comes to his workers, he says, the Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. He's praying over his staff. As he sees Naomi, sees a foreigner, he says, who's that? Allow her to clean my field. Allow her to drink from the water pitcher. Nobody harass her. Nobody harass her. That's a beautiful picture, right? That's a beautiful picture. You'll, you'll probably hear that picture again coming up. Um, again, he, he protects her. Naomi knows God's directive regarding the kinsman redeemer, and she instructs Ruth to go to Boaz and um, to lie at his feet. And Boaz covers her with his cloak, which means that he would redeem her if there's a proviso. He says there's a nearest living relative that has a first right of redemption. The older brother has a first right. We go to him, we ask him if he will redeem you. And we'll talk about everything that redemption means in that. But so Boaz um, goes in the public square again, he is following God's command. Because if we have the Bible, how do you do these things? He goes to the city gate. He calls the other ten witnesses, the men of the, of the community. He tells the first kinsman, you have a right to redeem. He says, yep, yep, I'll do that. I'll buy that land that uh, Ruth is wanting to sell. And Boaz says, yep, but with that, you must marry Ruth, the Moabite. Because you must have that children can protect the name of her dead husband. <sighs> can't do that. I can't risk my inheritance. I can't risk my name to redeem a Moabite. Can't do it. So, Boaz does uh, marry Ruth. He does um, jeopardize his inheritance. The kinsman who didn't want to risk his name and risk his inheritance, is not named and is never spoken again of in the Bible. Right? He's not named, he's never spoken of again in the Bible. Boaz acts as the kinsman redeemer and redeems Naomi, or Ruth and marries Ruth. Boaz and Ruth become the lineage of our Savior, of our actual redeemer, Yeshua. Because and from their union becomes a child, Obed, who becomes the father of Jesse, who becomes the father of David, perhaps you've heard of David. And so by risking his inheritance, by risking his name, by, risk, by being a redeemer, Boaz gets to have in his lineage and our, our redeemer, right? Final important points of uh, the book of Ruth and then some thoughts on it. The witnesses, as they witness the redemption process, give a spoken blessing to Boaz and Naomi. And they say, may the Lord bless, make this woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. And may you achieve wealth in Ephrata and become famous in Bethlehem. Spoken blessings are critically important. The spoken word is critically important. All of those things occur. They obtained fame. They became the father of Obed and Jesse and David. And Boaz was a very wealthy man. That's the book of Ruth in a nutshell. There is so, so, so much more. I would encourage you to go read Ruth. But tonight we're going to talk about the kinsman redeemer and just some of the lessons that are learned from the book of Ruth. Again, Naomi arrived in Bethlehem. When you hear teachers stand up here talking about robust and disgusted, picture Naomi. She's lost her husband. She's walked away from God. She's been in a foreign land for 10 years. And she's returning to bitter. Naomi makes the decision to return to the promised land and to her God. Changed her life forever. Ruth left her family, left her gods, and inherited Yahweh, the God of Israel. It changed her life forever. Ruth was a Moabite, which was looked down upon, prejudiced against, whatever you want to say. Moabites were not well looked at. But when she made her profession of faith, 
the God of Israel came through from a Moabite to an heir to the throne. To an heir to the throne. And literally to a relative of our redeemer. Through Ruth's faith and God's faithfulness, Naomi got rid of her bitterness. She was able to get rid of her bitterness. And very much like the testimony that was shared earlier about the idols, you can get rid of bitterness. That's what this box is about. Getting rid of bitterness, getting rid of jealousy and envy and unbelief and all of the demons that haunt us and torment us and steal our faith. But before God changes our circumstances, He wants to change our heart. He wants to change our heart. If our circumstances change for the better, but we remain the same, we become more shocked. When you talk, you talk about the demons that are cast out and they go away, if, they, if the space is not filled, they'll come back with a dozen of them. Okay? For the legion of them. And so that's why God wants to change our heart first to prepare us so that we don't get ourselves working. And that's what you see in this. Orpah, the daughter-in-law who went back to her family, who went back to her daughter, just like the first kingdom, never mentioned again in the Bible, we know nothing about her, right? She lost out on the beautiful future that she could have. Boaz was able and willing to pay the price to redeem and Ruth, the closer kinsman, was not willing to pay the price. As I said, Boaz became the um, in the lineage of Yeshua, where the other redeemer, the, the other possible redeemer, his name was not even uh, mentioned anywhere. Lessons learned: one person trusting the Lord and obeying His commands will change a situation from the defeat to victory and can change the world. One person can do that. If we return from where we have strayed, Yeshua will bring us back from bitterness to pleasantness and report our names. Take us from a low life to a God of life. That's the message of Ruth. He'll bring us back from bitterness to pleasantness. Naomi says in the book, or yeah, Naomi says in the book, excuse me, God has turned his hand against me. God didn't turn his hand against Naomi. God doesn't turn his hand against us. We walk away, right, exactly as Elimelech and Ruth, or Naomi did. They walked away from Judah. They went to Moab. We walk away from God. God never turns his back on us. Never turns his hand against us. Never turns his favor away from us if we're walking with him and staying under his shield. Boaz says to his servants, don't let anyone harass her as she's leaving the field. The lesson I learned from that is that even in the promised land, even in the presence, in the field of the Redeemer, you could be attacked, you could be harassed, you know, but the Redeemer tells those servants to stay away. And if you stay with him, and if you use his power and authority, like we talked about last week, no, I won't go there. No, I won't let that idol in my house. In the name of Jesus, I repent. Then you have safety in the field. As I said, I learned that our Redeemer is not just for Easter Sunday. Right? I mean, that's the most important lesson that I, I, I've known it, but by a different name. You know, without, when you really start studying and you really start applying Redeemer, it's not just Easter Sunday that our Redeemer is applicable. He is available 24-7, 365 days a week, and on week you are still available. 24-7, 365. Important. The blessings, spoken word, incredibly important. The spoken word, as I said with Boy. So, what I'd like to do if it's all right, is lead you in a repentance prayer and for, as I mentioned, everything we do is about praying. And what I'd like to do, if I could, is lead you in a repentance prayer for any way that you've so turned, as we all sometimes do, away from the Lord, away from the promised land, and away from the blessing. So, if you would repeat that for me. Heavenly Father, Lord, I repent for any way that I have so turned away from the promised land. 
My mission to forgive. My nature. Nature. It's my nature. You want to have your picture with us? Thank you, Janice. That was beautiful. And thank you, Lord, for speaking. Thank you. That is his nature, except for guilt. So we're going to talk about the kinsman redeemer a little bit more, um, a lot more, uh, and what scripture has to say about the kinsman redeemer. The redeemer is referred to as Gaal, um, and is um, described in Leviticus 25, 47 to 55. So again, a very biblical principle. The kinsman redeemer is the person who had the legal right to redeem redeem by buying back either a blood relative or a family's inheritance that was lost through debt or death. death. So a kinsman redeemer could buy someone back or buy the property back. As God explains in the Old Testament, there, there are things that are very, very important to God. And it, a lot of things are very important to God. But one of the the uh, real principles of the Hebrew land is that it was not to leave the family. That you not sell your property away from your family. That it not be taken away from the family. That there always be an opportunity to redeem the land. Always be an opportunity. Even if you took, if you took a loan against the land, for instance, they would figure the number of years until the year of Jubilee and that would be the interest that you paid as a payment. But in the year of Jubilee, the land had to return to the right of owner. Same with the slave or a servant. If a person sold their self into indenturedness, it would only be for the number of years until the year of Jubilee. And then they had to be set free. Unless they became a bond servant, which you hear Paul talk about becoming a bond servant. And that is voluntarily saying, I never want to be free. And that's what Paul's saying is, is I'm, I'm a bond servant to Yeshua, is I, I never want to be free. I never want to be set free. The other thing really important about what God says about the land is that you've got to let the land rest. Right? You've got to let the land rest. That's probably why the famine that's talked about at the beginning of the group, because people didn't listen to God. And what God says to us is, you've got to rest. Right? I created the Sabbath for you to rest. That's exactly what he's talking about in the land. It's important to him where he would have had it written down. And by the way, there are more words to discuss the command about observing the Sabbath than any other command in the Bible. 
it must have been important to him. Right? It must have been important. So, the kinsman redeemer is part of God's plan that the lamb can never ever be taken away from a family completely. Go ahead, Jess. I like the, the idea between the difference between a slave and a bond servant. Mm-hmm. That if it's bond servant, it's all about choosing. Oh, yeah. 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 That is a good point. Yeah, because the only way to become a bond servant is for you to do it. I never want to be set free. So, you do it. Yes. So, there are six duties of a kinsman redeemer. First, um, he had to have a willingness to perform the act. That's first and foremost. You see from the redeemer, the eligible redeemer, he was not willing to perform the act. But you have to be willing to perform the act. You had to be free yourself. You had to be free yourself. You couldn't be a slave. You couldn't be a debt. You had to be free yourself. You had to be able to pay the price of redemption. Right? Because if someone has a lien against the piece of property, you have to be able to pay that off in full. You had to be able to pay the price. You had to be a blood relative. I couldn't step in and say, I want to redeem your inheritance. We're not blood relatives. You have to be a blood relative. The Redeemer was responsible to redeem the land, buy it back, and to remove all squatters and invaders currently occupying it. It was his duty to go clear it. If somebody squatted on it, out they go. And finally, he had to serve as the judicial executor on behalf of the murdered relative. If a relative was murdered, and the Bible is very clear about murder, laying in wait and taking a life versus some type of accident. But a laying in wait homicide, the kinsman redeemer had a duty to go slay the murderer. Those are the responsibilities. And if you um, really look at the kinsman redeemer, and again, if you look at the book of Ruth and the, the entire gospel message, Right there, this display of the shark. Yeshua, our Redeemer, had a willingness to redeem. Right? He had an absolute willingness to redeem. He willingly went to the cross to redeem the Jew, to redeem Kobe and to redeem him. He willingly did that to fulfill God's work. He had to be free himself. He couldn't be of the lineage of a Roman because sin was passed down through the Father. So the only human blood that he could have, really, was his mother, Mary. Conceived by the Holy Spirit, a virgin birth, that's being free himself, free from sin. Had to be able to pay the price of redemption. He's the only one who was able to pay the price of redemption. The only one. Because the price of redemption was you. The, the price of redemption is probably huger than any of us can even visualize because it's not just a matter of dying on the cross. It's not just a matter of dying for my sins. It's a matter of dying for the entire world's sin. And the world's sin being loaded on him and crushing absolutely crushing And descending into hell for three days. So, um, he had to be uh, able to pay the price and willing to, he was. He had to be a blood relative that's why he calls us sons and daughters. And he is our blood relative. He was to redeem the land and remove all of the squatters and invaders currently occupying it. That is exactly what he does when we go through a repentance prayer and say, Lord, I have allowed this into my life. I don't want it anymore. Help me get rid of it. In the name of Jesus, get out. He's clearing the invaders and the squatters out of our land. Amen. That's, that's, that's what he's doing. Clearing the invaders and the squatters. Had to serve as the judicial executor on behalf of the murdered relative. Yeah. That's exactly what Jesus is going to do. If you read the book of Revelation, when the battle's over, Satan's lost. 
They have lost. When Satan executed, murdered, lied in wait for Adam and Eve, lied in wait for Adam and Eve to murder them. The wages of sin and death, and he led Adam and Eve into sin. Right? So that those are the duties and responsibilities of the kinsman redeemer, and how Yahshua has fulfilled each and every one of those duties and obligations. Jewish legal positions, um, there are several things um, we just talked about on the chart, but the Levite marriage refers to the Levite marriage refers to the kinsman redeemer marrying the bride of a dead relative, having children with her, raising them in the dead relative's name so that his legacy continues. So that his legacy continues. Uh, and the property raising the crops on the property in his name. The blood of injured rules, again, if someone lays in wait, murders a relative, the uh, kinsman redeemer is to uh, execute that murder. Cities of refuge, again, the Bible is pure about lying in wait and accidental taking a life. An accidental taking of a life, a person could flee to specified cities of refuge and could take refuge in that city. And as long as they stayed in that city, the Redeemer could not execute them. So, again, in God's plan, despite the horrible mistakes that we make and the walking away from the promised land and walking away from God, He has always got some plan in place to, to rescue us, to give us a city of refuge, to give us a Redeemer, to continue his love for us and always be available for us. The gleaning of the fields, again, is God's command. Taking care of foreigners, taking care of the poor, not giving out welfare, but making it there available that if they're willing to work, they can go glean the fields and they can get some food. Again, God's got the plan, right? And the year of Jubilee, during the year of Jubilee, seven sevens, all dead as he raised, it is a year for uh, resetting of the property, a resetting of life, a resetting of slaves, things like that. The year of Jubilee, a celebration. Again, um, studying Ruth and studying the, the book about Kinsman Redeemer, all of a sudden you find the word Redeemer scattered throughout the Bible and the importance of Redeemer um, starts sinking in. Exodus 6.6, 6, God says, therefore, so say to the people of Israel, I am Adonai. I will free you from the forced labor of the Egyptians, rescue you from your oppression, redeem you with an outstretched arms with great judgment. I will rescue you from your oppression. Those are sweet words. Rescue you from your oppression. Psalm 49, 15 God will redeem me from Shaul's control because he will receive me. He will rescue me from the enemy's control because he will receive me. And where you see me, you're me. Right? <laughs> just, just in case it's not clear, when the Bible talks about redeeming me or rescuing me or God's willingness to do something for someone, He's talking specifically about you and you and, and you, right? That's who God's talking about. Psalm 138, he will redeem Israel, God's people. Again, me, us, that's who we will redeem from all of the wrongdoing. From all of the wrongdoing. Because God doesn't turn his back on people, doesn't turn his back on people. People walk away from God. All their own doings. Galatians 4 and 5, so that he might redeem those in subjugation to legalism and thus enable us to become God's son. Enable us to become God's son. Legalism set Jesus' hair on fire. When, you know, when the Pharisees and the Sadducees start laying down rules that not a human being could keep, no one could keep, including themselves, as they walked around with all their piety and with all their robes and with all their ribbons, it upset Jesus. 
when he turned over the tables in the temple and threw a temper tantrum about, don't do this in my father's house, it's because of legalism. And he will redeem us for that. He doesn't want us to be in a legal relationship with him. He wants a loving relationship. He wants those walks in the cool of the evening in the garden that are talked about in Genesis. That's what he wants. Ruth 4, 14. Blessed be Adonai, who today has provided you a redeemer. May his name be renowned in all of his religion. Blessed be the name of Adonai. We should say that very often. And our hearts should cry it. Blessed be the name of Adonai. My Redeemer helps me with a mighty outstretched arm. That outstretched arm. If you, if you think of an outstretched arm, you think about the back. Prodigal son, as he's coming down the road, do you think his father wasn't running to him with his arms out? That his father wasn't sitting in the room going, you took your inheritance and walked away. Right? And he wasn't saying, you didn't send a Christmas card. And he was running down the road with outstretched arms. With outstretched arms. And I think that's what the Redeemer, the picture of the Redeemer with the mighty outstretched arms. I think that's the picture that we should have. Because as we decide to return to the promised land, like Naomi did, God runs to us with his arms outstretched to throw around us and hug us. He helps me in my dark situations. Helps me from all of my wrongdoings. It's always me that's doing wrong, right? It's not God. God doesn't do wrong. It's always me. He turns me from legalism to relationship. There is nothing at all pleasant about legalism. There's, there is nothing at all pleasant about legalism. About trying to perfectly obey every rule. There's nothing pleasant about it. It's oppressive. That's what Jesus was talking about. I know his life because he doesn't weigh people down with legalism. He wants relationship. And finally, my Redeemer was sent to save me. Save me from myself. That's why my Redeemer was sent. And at the same time, to save all of you. Psalm 19.14 May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart be acceptable in your presence, Adonai my rock and my redeemer. May the words, the thoughts of my heart be acceptable and the words of my mouth. I'm sorry, I didn't hit the button. Our thoughts should be on Adonai and, and we should be bl- saying, as I say, blessed be the name of Adonai. Blessed be the name of Adonai. I was, last weekend I was um, out at the cabin and I have a cabin in Beluga that I just love. And at the end of the airstrip is the Alaska Range. And the sun was shining on the Alaska Range as it's starting to rise. Snow-covered mountain peaks, gorgeous orange and gold colored leaves, and a big bull moose with grass all packed in his hair standing there. And I just could not stop my voice from screaming how great is my God. And singing that song, I, I couldn't, I didn't try very hard, but I don't think I could have physically stopped it. And that's what that verse is talking about. Praise be to Adonai. Our God is the most incredible artist. And, I mean, incredible artist, incredible thought of everything. Every time I think of a way to mess it up, He's got a plan to redeem me. He's got a plan to bring me back. And to say, no, 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 not that way, son. Come here, come here, come here. Right? And it's a constant correction. <laughs> but he's always got a plan how to do that. And that's the beauty of the Redeemer. Isaiah 41, 14. Have no fear, you men of Israel. I will help you, says Adonai. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Read the first words again and see the importance. Have no fear. I will help you, says Adonai. That's our God talking. Have no fear. I will help you. 
Enough said. And no fear, I will help you. Isaiah 63, 16. For you and your father, even Abraham, were not known to us, and Israel has not acknowledged us. You, Adonai, our father, our redeemer of old is your name. You, Adonai, our father, our redeemer of old is your name. Job 19.25 this is where that song comes from. I know that my Redeemer lives. Job, Job states that. And Job did believe that. He says, I know that my Redeemer lives. But in the end, he will rise on the dust. You should know that your Redeemer lives and is for way more than just Easter Sunday morning. I think that's what all the verses are telling us here. Jeremiah 50, 34 but the Redeemer is, their Redeemer is strong. The Lord of hosts is His name. He will thoroughly plead their cause so that He can give rest to the land, but unrest to those who live in Babylon. Yeah! Babylon was the enemy right next door, right? They're always harassing the Hebrews. Well, Jeremiah was a great prophet. And Jeremiah says, their Redeemer is strong. He will thoroughly plead their cause. And again, when, when we're talking about me or they or he will thoroughly plead your cause. Right? Your cause. He will defend you. He will give you that correction, that nudge. That's what Jeremiah is saying. So that he can give rest to the land, and the land is also us. But unrest to those who live in Babylon. Babylon was probably one step below the Moabites. So when, when he's talking about giving unrest to Babylon, people are going, yeah, 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 get them Babylonians. Get them. Psalm 49, 7 and 8, no man can carry by any means, or no man can by any means redeem his brother or give the God as a ransom for him. For redemption of his soul is costly and he should cease trying forever. The redemption of a soul, as I said, the, the price, I don't think we can even imagine the price that Jesus paid. Taking the sin of the entire world. If you, if you think of how guilty you can feel over some incident, that some sin that you've committed before repenting and giving it to God, multiply that times an infinity, and that's what Jesus took on. That's what Jesus took on. Romans 3.24, being justified as a gift by His grace through redemption, which is in Jesus Christ. Justified as a gift through redemption. One of the things that, that came to me as, as I was praying about all this this weekend, again, because I hadn't taught this class before, I spent a lot of time in prayer about it. Do you realize that Jesus bought you back, paid a price to a thief, to someone who stole you, when you already belong again. He paid a thief to get you back. That's how much he loves you. You already belong to him, right? Is he buying something new, something he didn't already own? He is pay, willing to pay that price because he loves you that much. No, I was like, you know what, like you're saying, there's no pain in my pants anymore. 
he couldn't look at his past without you know, breaking down at all these, these points. And uh, I just thought that was yeah, it's interesting and very true. And you know, the, the same comparison, you you could be at right drunk and not be sober. Right? You could be a good Christian or a good person, excuse me, a good person and not be a Christian. You could live a very moral life and we're not gonna see them in heaven. Right? <laughs> you could Try and get rid of all that, but unless you give it to God, unless you walk with God, you're missing the mark. Missing the mark. So, yeah, invite your friends to class. There's this guy to class. It is a process, too. I mean, yeah. Right. Right. Start him with a testimony, right? Well, this was his testimony because he does have two years of sobriety. So, if he's on the road, he just has one line. He just has a undergone the healing that this class offers. Right. In, in all these past situations, like it was just, I was able to see it so clearly because of how he was breaking down. These weren't like tears of joy. You know, these were these, you know, these painful memories. And that's what you guys keep here is, you know, there's no pain when I look back at these memories. Where there's no regret, no remorse. And uh, there's been some other people I've ran into that I felt like, like this one other guy is like, man, he really needs this. But you can't convince somebody to come here. You know, they have to want to come on their own. And so the, the way you want them to come on their own, if, if you listen to my bride speak, and someone that we know and love, we watch their life change dramatically, and we go, I want some of that, right? I want some of that. And that's what it is about our whole relationship. If you show someone who God is, they're going to go, I want some of that. That's good stuff, right? That's good stuff. I want some of that. Thank you for sharing that. I totally agree with you. So Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood. Because it's through Jesus' blood that we have redemption. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he has lavished upon us. Lavish isn't like a sprint. Lavish isn't like a handful. Lavish is like a dump truck dumped on you. <laughs> right? Lavish means in abundance. In abundance. He has dumped his grace upon us. He's given us our grace. Words are important. And that lavish, if we're talking dump truck load, there we're talking bad. More than you even think of great for. More than you think we're great for. Hebrews 9, 12. It's not through the blood of goats or calves, but through his own blood he entered the holy place once and for all, earning our eternal redemption. For an Old Testament Hebrew, they would understand that because the high priest would sacrifice the blood of the goats and the calves and would enter the holy place in the name of forgiveness of sin. Once and for all, Jesus did it, not in the name of. Once and for all, Jesus did it, and he achieved it. He did it, and he achieved it. Jesus did it try. Why are there so many uh, references to Redeemer and Ransom and Redemption in the Old Testament? Or in the Old Testament, in the Bible, excuse me. Because it is scattered throughout the Bible. Because the Redeemer is not for me. It's not about Easter morning. God wants to be very, very clear about who He is and what He is able to do. Very clear. Oh, sorry about that. Redeem appears 56 times in the Bible. The word redeem, 56 times in the Bible. Redeemed, past tense, that verse 62 times. Redeemer appears 18 times. And when they're talking about the Redeemer, who are they talking about? Yes. The true, right? Redeeming, the act of redeeming appears three times, and redemption appears 20 times. If God spends that much time talking about a subject, do you think that it might be important to God? Right? 
hey, it's important to him. That's what he's able to do. That's what he's willing to do. That's what he has done. When our God redeems us, he saved, he gave us a Savior for salvation. Did I see a hand somewhere? He made us whole and healed us and preserved us in wellness. Preserved us in wellness. That's what we walk in is in wellness. That's what we're able to walk in. Sadly, we as humans always... Uh, Satan first is the great imitator, right? And he convinces humans uh, to be imitators. And we can try and be our own redeemer. And we do that if we deny our sin. If we say, oh, that's, that's not sin. That's, that's not mine. That's just, you know, or we, no, I'm, not, I'm not really sinning. I mean, it's, if we deny it, if we blame others for our circumstance, if we justify it or excuse it, or if we minimize it, we're trying to act as our own redeemer. We make a very poor redeemer. God makes a very, very good redeemer. And you don't want to be at your trial in front of Jesus and minimizing your well, it wasn't as bad as John uh, Rose, right? Oh God ain't bad or Peter. He bad. Mine wasn't quite that bad. That's not where we want to be. What part of our life needs to be redeemed? Emotional pain. The pain that you talk about from our existence. What's broken in your life? Most of us arrived at this class. Just about everyone in here arrived, broke, busted, and disgusted. Like Naomi, coming back from Moab and just going, man, you can't, you can't even call me Naomi, call me even tomorrow. Because I'm going to sit in the back and I'm going to kind of have weird expectations. I'm not sure what to expect from this class. And eventually, by repeating it and by letting God talk to us and forgive us and tell us who we really are, because Satan beats people up and says, Oh, you are, you're so bad, you're, oh, nobody will love you, you're, oh, oh. And God says, You're my child. You're beautiful. I love you. Right? And so that's the broken in our life. That's why we're here, to get rid of the broken in our life and to find our need. If you've gone down the wrong path, that's God's specialty. God's specialty is stepping down and going, not that way, son. That hurt us back into the room. What hurt us? That's what he's here for. Choices that you have made or are now making. Does anybody in this room make perfect choices? You gotta choose. It that's the importance of learning the, what the Bible says and what the biblical foundations are all about. It's about daily choosing. That's the Jackson's title of her book, Which Will You Choose? That's not a one-time thing. That's a every day, every time, you know, which will you choose? Um, abuse and trauma, jobs, history, those are the kind of things that um, people need redeemed from, that we all need redeemed from. And finally, from patterns in their life, from families, from marriage, um, from work, all of those things can, can drag people down, right? All of those things. So why did God create us to be obedient with no... Why didn't He create us to be obedient with no um, ability to sin? Because, I mean, if, if he knew we were going to sin, right? He, he wasn't caught blindsided. He wasn't uh, surprised. So why would he make us uh, have the ability to sin? Because true love is a choice. It's a decision, right? If, if you're created without an ability to sin, you're nothing more than a robot, right? Uh, if, you, if you don't have to choose love, a rock, you remember they used to uh, have, I don't know, one of the 80s? They used to sold pet rocks, right? Pet rocks. And they sold like four million pet rocks. You walk outside and they pet rocks. Right? <laughs> they sold four million pet rocks. And your pet 
Yeah. 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 Y
what Jesus does for us. He redeems us from the hand of the enemy. And there's no way that we can do it ourselves. And there's none of us who haven't sinned. At least, at least why it's not me. Certainly not me. How did God provide a blood relative? This is why Jesus was not born of an earthly father. Because the sin of the father passes down through the blood. He could, uh, he could not have redeemed himself or anyone else. But he was born of God's line, not of a corruptible seed. Not of a corruptible seed. So redeem is to release on receipt of ransom the purchasing of a slave in order to grant his freedom. Leviticus 17, 11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. It's only blood that can make atonement for the soul. Jesus is my redemption. 1 Corinthians 1.30 hit the buttons too many times. So Jesus is our Redeemer. Um, and through His blood, He has paid the price for our soul. Paid the price. Anybody have any questions? Or any comments? I have a question. Go. Hey, on the, uh, the year of Jubilee, is that um, just a set time that people the calendar goes through and everyone has it or does each individual have No, it's a set a cycle of seven. So and the Hebrew calendar follows. So wherever you happen to be, like in that Hebrew calendar, wherever you come, you were born at different times in here. But everyone would have to follow the Hebrew calendar rather than an individual. Follow the calendar. It's a seven-year cycle, and then seven.
that's what the diagonal cross is. That's huge for the just the diagonal to be the That, that is huge, and it's also, um, it goes back to my discovery as I'm reading the, the Redeemer's not just about dying on the cross and, and when you die, going to heaven. That's so not the you know? So not it. The Redeemer's there with his outstretched arms, waiting to save us from Satan's attack, waiting to save us from our stupid choices, our stupid decisions. That, that is that. Revelation about what redemption is. That it's like uh, paying the price to buy back my pain and past. So that it's no longer mine, it's his. Right. He removes it. And so this redemption, paying the price of redemption was, was like a light bulb. Because there's no amount of money on earth that could redeem us, right? No amount of money, it's only blood. Psalm 49, 8, our redemption is costly. It costs God his only son. Our redemption is costly. What was God's desire for a kinsman redeemer that he had come to earth? To fulfill the law and redeem his people. Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Go ahead, Robert. The word fulfill, I think, is to be considered. Yeah. Because it's not the word that is to demonstrate what all of the law, Yahweh's uh, designs are, not just to complete them and then have them run away with them. Fulfill, I understand to do the requirements of good, 
of righteousness, of salvation. So the kids of the Redeemer was following rules that were put out there by, by the good and loving and just being, uh, rather than always fulfilling God's done. Right. Yeah. And now done. Which um, fulfilled, the people used to argue that Jesus fulfilled the law and therefore it doesn't apply the same thing. It's a wrong, wrong connotation. Wrong connotation. Finally, John 15, 13, greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friend. Literally, that's what a redeemer did. Came and laid down his life for us. They no longer call us servants, they call us friends. So, and I pray over you, pray a blessing over you. The spoken word is very, very important. And I'm going to tell you that one. So, I'm about it, Lord. These are your readings, and we are your readings. You are an amazing God, and we thank you for lavishing us with your grace, with your love, yes, you with your willingness to be our redeemer, your willingness to go to cross, your willingness to, to greet us with us for a time. Lord, I pray over every person in this room that they see your outstretched arms, that they feel your grace, that they feel your call to them, and your willingness to redeem your eternal love I pray that for you this morning. I pray that this message sink in with the words that you want for the message that you want for for each of us in an individual way that we can do. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to teach here tonight. Send each person away from there with blessings of safety.